as you say, no pressure. Uh, good morning. It's great to be here. Um, as the water slides onto the floor here, it's great to be here. Always a breeze in Liverpool, a little protest. And of course, an action packed agenda for the Royal College of GPs, which I was just looking at on the train on the way up. And I can see that you're all going to be intensely busy with uh, highly relevant topics, including uh, primary care in the Amazon. And for those of you who've got nothing better to do at 6.15 tonight, I see that uh, David Wheeler is leading a session called Clouding for GPs, in which uh, GPs will be able to develop a sense of playfulness, uh, clown theatre improvisation, and learn how making mistakes and landing oneself in it can be welcomed as a way of creating new insights. That's certainly the approach I'm going to be taking in speaking to you this morning. So, uh, sorry David, I won't be able to make your session, which I see actually is fully booked, it says in the programme, unlike a number of the other worthier events, including one that Mike Pringle is leading, which appears still to have spaces available. Um, but uh, the reality is, I think that we're at a defining moment for general practice in this country. And we may, when we come to look back on this period, think that, this was one of the inflection points about the conversation in terms of how the health service should develop and what the role of primary care in it should be. I think based on the common sense that we just heard from Naomi and the points that the college has been expressing very forcefully and effectively over the last, not just the last several months, but under Maureen's leadership and Claire's before, the reality is that it is time to take seriously the value of general practice in this country it is time to get real about the pressures that you are facing, and it is time to get constructive about a range of actions that are going to be needed to put general practice on the sustainable footing that the country deserves. So what's that going to mean in practice? Well, the suggestion from Naomi about uh, can we come up with a system that does a better value than two pounds a patient visit, uh, whatever the figure was uh, you used. Of course not. General practice is not only one of the defining design features of the National Health Service, it actually explains many of the reasons why the NHS is rated highly in the international surveys that people look at, including the Commonwealth Fund. And certainly the argument I've been making on your behalf, including to some of our elected representatives, uh, is that actually rather than thinking that uh, general practice in some sense is uh, being over-resourced, overpaid, uh, people are being ripped off, actually what's been delivered in general practice is remarkable value for money. And if you look at uh, I, my first appearance at the uh, Public Accounts Committee was defending your honour in respect of uh, GP out of hours services and the case was being mounted that in some way uh, providing complete coverage uh, for 365 days a year both through GP out of hour services and the 111 service for less than £10 per person uh, was not good value for money. And I said, look, for the cost of less than a cinema ticket, how can you possibly believe that that is true? So, yes, we've got to make that case, but yes, we've got to confront the fact that my friends who are GPs, uh, of whom I have a number, I am absolutely convinced are working flat out, and I'm sure that is true for most of you as well. And so the idea that there is a lot of flex sitting in the primary care uh, infrastructure, that is obviously not the position we find ourselves in. And part of that is because when you look at what's happened over the last 10 or 15 years, some really strange things have happened in the National Health Service. One of those strange things is that if you had said back in 2000, we're going to have a big increase in the number of doctors in this country on the back of the extra spending, and we're going to have a 21% increase in the number of whole-time equivalent GPs, but we're going to have a 76% increase in the number of hospital doctors, I think people would have said, that's mad. But that's precisely what has happened. So we do, I think, need to seriously take stock as we look out over the next five years and beyond about what can be done to address these real pressures, building on the intrinsic value of list-based general practice and recognising the uh, enormous contribution that primary care itself makes to the NHS as a whole. So I've got five suggestions to share with you to kind of kickstart a conversation. Your uh, 
rather wonderful uh, RCGP manifesto had 10, so uh, there is some overlap, but uh, mine are more distilled. Um, and I will just give you a, a flavor of what they might be. The first is I do accept that we've got to stabilize and review core GP fund holding. Uh, funding. The second is we've got to give GP-led CCGs more clout over the way in which um, NHS services are planned in the round. Uh, the third is that we've got to pull out all the stops on uh, the general practice and the primary care workforce. The fourth is that we're going to need to support GPs who want to evolve new models of care. And the fifth is we're going to need to set a new relationship with the public and with patients in terms of their interactions with the National Health Service, including with you. So let me just uh, give you a bit of a sense of what might be behind each of those. First point, stabilizing and reviewing core GP fund holding. We have just this week uh, agreed with the uh, GPC in the Department of Health, the 2015-16 uh, GMS contract, and are effectively looking for a period of stability. Uh, in GMS uh, for next year with some adjustments to ensure that where there's been population growth that is reflected in people's uh, income. But as we look out over the course of the next three to five years I'm certainly in no doubt at all that we do need to see substantial increases in investment in primary care. In the immediate term just as we've heard from Naomi about the MPIG issue which obviously has the potential, had the potential uh, to be disruptive, but which you could also argue, well, you may laugh, but you could also argue that actually it's a 17-year transition on MPIG, 2004, 17 years. So the honest conversation we need to have is that if we do want equitable distribution of funding and we think that's different than what we've got now, there is inevitably at some point going to be some sort of transition. So getting that transition right is something that we didn't do clearly in respect of the practices most affected by the MPIG changes. I think we were probably about to make the same mistake in respect of PMS funding and the review that was done of PMS funding across the country identified £325 million of funding over and above what would have been um, attributable for an equivalent GMS contract of which £67 million was identifiable against specific extra services or higher quality that was being delivered. So not unreasonably, in the interest of equity, there was a conversation about how do we uh, move uh, PMS resources as well. But I think uh, what we have uh, listened and heard and adjusted uh, and announced uh, this week is that that will not be a two-year uh, review which will be particularly disruptive in uh, some uh, key parts of the country but is going to be a minimum of four years. All of the funding that is uh, reallocated has to be reinvested in general practice services and the default assumption is it has to remain within the CCG area unless CCGs you choose to share. So we're going to have to, um, as we have these uh, slower paces of transition, also undertake a fundamental review of the Carhill formula and the way in which resources are fairly allocated in general practice. And so I think stabilizing what would otherwise have been those disruptions while that takes place is the first and reasonable response to the circumstances under which we find ourselves. The second is that we've got to give GPs more clout in the way in which the health service overall uses its funds and operates. And obviously CCGs are a vehicle for doing that. We are the only country, England is the only country in the world where two thirds of our health service budget is controlled by primary care doctors. And those of you who do work internationally will know that that is a source actually of um, some envy on the part of uh, primary care physicians in other countries' healthcare systems. I think CCGs have had a successful first year. Today we are publishing the results of the annual CCG assurance exercise and the results of the Ipsos Mori survey work asking individual GP practices and other stakeholders how do they think CCGs have done uh, in this past year. And actually the results are very encouraging. 70% of practices uh, say that they are satisfied with the level of engagement they've had with their GPs. 
And interestingly, but perhaps uh, unsurprisingly, 77% of practices in smaller CCGs say that they are getting uh, good levels of engagement compared with 65% in larger CCGs. For my money, that points us towards the conclusion that we should not be expecting lots of further CCG mergers. Uh, there's no right answer as to what the number of uh, CCGs should be, but there's a wrong answer, and that's to keep changing your mind. So I think CCGs uh, can be proud of the GP-led work that they have been doing, but I think there's an opportunity to give them more power and influence over the NHS budget as a whole. And so for those CCGs who want to take on either shared or exclusive responsibility for making investment decisions in primary care, we are giving that power away from NHS England to CCGs uh, from next April. Likewise, for those CCGs uh, that are interested in taking more involvement in the use of specialised services in their area so that money can be reinvested in local services where that makes sense. For example, um, diabetes prevention rather than bariatric surgery, uh, we're going to be making that offer to CCGs uh, for next year as well. So the second point here then is that we do have this unique set of arrangements in this country where primary care doctors are able to have a significant influence over the way our total health service is uh, being uh, funded and uh, services are being deployed and we should build on that chassis rather than discard it and we should not mess around uh, with administrative arrangements purely for the sake of some new administrative um, endeavour or uh, attempt at uh, neatness. The third is obviously workload and workforce and I think what we've got to do there is pull out all the stops on every aspect of primary care workforce. There's no silver bullet, there's no one thing that's going to do the trick. We're going to need an all of the above approach. And we're going to have to, in doing that, frankly, start with general practice as it actually is now, not as we think it used to be. And I'll come on and explain what I mean by that in a, a moment. Um, but I'm particularly thinking about the rise of women as GPs, and I'm thinking about the rise of uh, salaried and sessional GPs and in my opinion we have not properly reflected in our um, arrangements in general practice that sea change which has occurred over the course of the last decade or so. Uh, you think back to the early 2000s um, just north of a third of GPs were women that's now uh, more than half. If you think about the uh, proportion of uh, GPs under the age of 35 I think it's something like uh, three quarters are women. And if you think about the desire, the legitimate desire for sessional or part-time work sometimes, then how can it be that it is so difficult to get an NHS email account if you're a sessional GP? How can it be that your prescribing is done in somebody else's name? How can it be that you are left out of the formal membership responsibilities uh, in the CCG? These are all the kind of things that, in the sense, the NHS has not caught up with the changes in the structure of general practice that have occurred over the last 10 or 15 years, and we need to do that. And that means that we've got to change the way in which we think about uh, return uh, to work schemes, retention schemes. Uh, I personally think, and Maureen has uh, marked my card on this one, that um, it perhaps makes no sense that if you've been out of the workforce for a year and a day, then you have to go through a whole rigmarole in order to get back onto the performers list. We need a more sensitive uh, solution there. Um, we also need to uh, get more serious about um, other ways of supporting people who want to move between different parts of uh, the health service uh, through their career. So yes, we've got retention, we've got flexibility, but training obviously is important, and I know uh, you had a uh, lively debate on that uh, yesterday. I think there are, what, 9,000 or so GPs in training right now. Health Education England, uh, I am told, uh, say that they are on track for about 5,000 more GPs uh, with half of doctors coming off foundation training expected to go into GP training uh, in 2016. Um, but that, if we could do more on that, frankly, we clearly should. There's a, there's a balancing act to be struck here, and this is a, a, a conundrum, which is that quite rightly, you are telling it as it is in general practice, as a wake-up call for those who need to work with you to respond. But 
The danger is that that wake-up call sounds like a proposition to young doctors that you want to steer clear of general practice. And so how to have that honest conversation without it also becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy such that we end up with um, huge swathes of the country where training places are not filled, that is something that I know you will be uh, collectively re reflecting on. So we've got a lot to do on workforce, that's obvious. But the fourth thing that I think is inevitably got to be part of the future conversation about where the NHS is headed is how the very model of primary care itself is going to evolve. Now, one of the great strengths of general practice in Britain has been its diversity. And linked to its diversity, its adaptability. So there is not one size fits all. There is not a uh, single model. That has meant that, quite rightly, we have different configurations of services, different choices that GPs make about how to offer services uh, based on different populations. Uh, Jubilee Street is never going to look the same as um, Hexham uh, in uh, Northumberland, uh, or Cumbria is going to be facing different challenges uh, than uh, Birmingham Cross City CCG in, in central Birmingham. Um, so we've got to recognise that diversity and that adaptability. And we've also, however, got to face up to two other uh, issues which I think sometimes get in the way of the conversation we need about how general practice will develop. One is that the economic model of uh, independent practice, uh, which, by the way, I don't see um, uh, withering uh, on the vine or certainly not disappearing uh, anytime soon. I think the extent to which GPs choose to stay as uh, independent contractors will be a matter for GPs themselves. Many, as we've seen through uh, the last decade or so, are choosing to move into other arrangements, but that's a voluntary, that's a voluntary matter. But the, the consequence of the economic model we've had with general practice has been flexibility, but it has also meant that sometimes the debate about necessary extra investment in primary care gets obscured by a debate about earnings in primary care. We also have an issue where the route for building practice infrastructure and premises may have been fit for purpose um, in 1948, but in many ways is now not fit for purpose. And a survey I think I saw from the GPC a little while ago suggesting that nearly 70% of practices said that they were unable to take on additional, provide additional services, take on the expanded roles that they would contemplate by virtue of the uh, premises issues uh, that they are facing. So alongside the current models, which will remain, I think we're also going to want to see um, some other options available. And the college has been rightly advocating for um, federations as one possible model, and we will be uh, working with the college uh, on that. I think there are two uh, others that I want to uh, suggest to you uh, today, which are already beginning to bubble up in some parts of the country. These are voluntary, evolutionary, not one size fits all. The first is that I think in some places, as these larger federations of uh, GP uh, providers take shape, uh, there's no reason why they should just be confined to uh, general practice. I think it is perfectly possible to envisage them broadening to become multi-specialty uh, provider groups, including incorporating uh, consultants, uh, perhaps in some of the medical specialties, geriatrics, uh, psychiatry, uh, possibly even some uh, social care services, uh, therapies, nurses, and so on. There are models uh, beginning to bubble up like this, not at scale in most places. And there's no reason when that happens why you couldn't also envisage these larger uh, primary care groups taking on responsibilities or even uh, taking over the control of local parts of the health service, including community hospitals. Uh, a number of GPs that uh, I've spoken to, that's the evolutionary path they are interested in traveling. Should we uh, keep the current obstacles that stand in the way of that in their way? No, I don't think we should. There's a second option as well. Uh, which is that in some parts of the country, perhaps in some inner cities where the availability of, uh, it's, it's hard to recruit and where the um, current uh, GP services are struggling, should we for all time persist in the notion that 
GPs and hospitals can never be in the same organization. I don't think we should. I think if we're serious about integration, then we certainly don't want to take over by hospitals of general practice, but should we back the arrangements that now exist, for example, in uh, Northumberland uh, or in Newcastle or in one or two other places where you could say uh, that a single organization, a hospital, could also um, provide list-based uh, general practice on the same terms as other GPs. Uh, I think to rule that out across the board uh, would um, be uh, an assertion of uh, ideology over pragmatism, and uh, it's not to say that this is going to be the answer in many of these places. There are risks that we've got to be very careful about, but equally, when you look at the balance sheets of some of these large organizations, foundation trusts, uh, and you think about the need for premises investment and other uh, investment to provide the kind of expanded services we want, uh, it is ridiculous that in some of our most ill-served parts of the country with primary care, you've got this sitting there and is not being put to work to build primary care capacity. I think we're going to have to take a fundamental look, and we're doing this with Bruce Keogh and Keith Willett and others, at the way our urgent and emergency care uh, services work. I mean, frankly, we have a Heath Robinson concoction of um, out-of-hours, walk-in centres, um, uh, the 111 service, the 999 service, uh, the um, paramedics that are delivering on-site care that is completely confusing for the public in many parts of the country and utterly uh, dysfunctional. And I experienced this firsthand a few Friday nights back when I went to uh, Barking and Havering and the uh, Essex uh, GP out of our service, 111 service, uh, spent the Friday evening just listening to the calls that the GPs were dealing with and the um, uh, 111 service. And you could uh, write a little book on the, which you experience all the time in terms of how people are ending up in the wrong place. Uh, if you wanted to design a system that was uh, going to confuse and um, misallocate uh, resource, that's pretty much the system we've got. So we've got a big job of work collectively to do on redesigning those parts of the service as well. And that links to my fifth and final point, which is that we're going to need a new relationship with public and uh, with patients, and that's going to take uh, various forms. Uh, one of it is going to be much greater um, uh, clarity for the public about what is the right thing to do under particular circumstances. So this winter, for example, our uh, public information campaign is going to be squarely geared at getting folks with uh, coughs and sneezes to go to the pharmacist, not go to the GP surgery. And we think the pharmacists are an unused uh, resource across the NHS. Uh, we think that there is a, much, um, a need for much greater support for carers and for voluntary organisations across the country. We've got 1.4 million carers in this country who are providing more than 50 hours of unpaid care each week, and yet, for the most part, uh, the NHS um, uh, does very little uh, systematically to support them, meaning that we've got, for every paid employee in the NHS, there's an unpaid full-time worker who is kind of almost invisible uh, to the, the system. Um, so this is one of the areas where we're going to be putting quite a lot of effort in the uh, next five years and this uh, forward view. Uh, happy to talk more about those, but time probably prohibits. So I guess if I had to kind of summarize, I would say this. Um, I do think we get it. Uh, I think you have effectively made your case. I think we do need to put some stability into general practice right now. The first point, we do need to give you as GPs clout through CCGs. My second point, we do need to take an all the above approach to workforce issues. We do need to get more flexible on the models of care that GPs would like to evolve. And we do need to clarify for the public what reasonably can and can't be expected, while at the same time supporting them uh, in new ways. I by no means uh, am suggesting that uh, all told, uh, that will uh, do everything that needs to be done, but I do think those are some of the active ingredients of what collectively uh, the profession and the NHS needs at this point. And I think as we do that, by the way, uh, there are you know, some particulars we've got to uh, get right. Um, if uh, there's an opportunity for questions, I'll tell you about something uh, we're hoping you will work with us on with dementia. And my colleague, uh, Alistair Burns, is here. But uh, why don't I stop there and uh, delighted to take uh, your questions. Thank you.